So this video is all about Virtual D-Day 2024, because that has now been released in a public version. Um, so what's it about? Well, it's about, of course about all the new features, and it's also about the change features and the man mandatory conversions and stuff like that, that has happened. Uh, so that's all the stuff I'm going to get into. And of course, since this was released, there's been a few more builds uh, before the uh, the public release came out. And uh, that those are mainly fixes and maybe like additional settings and stuff. But you should certainly go for the latest public build, public release, if you will, not some older stuff. So what's included, really? Well, the main new feature is Cloud Drive. So that's a way that you can sync your lists to the cloud and from the cloud to other laptops. So basically... Uh, stuff that lets you use uh, whatever you work you do, including your track files, and use it everywhere on all your laptops. And that has can be based on different uh, cloud uh, drives, if you will. So Google Drive from Google, OneDrive, that's Microsoft, iCloud, that's Mac, Dropbox, that's its own company. So those are different options. I'm going to be using Dropbox. Then we're going to look at the library organization, what they call Unified, unified My Lists. Uh, because that's actually uh, a combination of the old playlists and old uh, virtual folders, which are now combined. So they, they're going to be automatically um, uh, converted when you, uh, when you launch Virtual D-Day 2024 the first time. So that's an important point. And then there's a new uh, Instant Folder Shortcut Toolbar. And uh, we'll look into that. I already done a video on that too, but we'll just go over the basics or what mo most people probably want to use. And then there's something called Link Tracks. That's been there for like a, a month maybe, um, and I've already done a video on that. That's what's been working uh, in previous versions also. Uh, but this is the Link Track view, as then we're going to look into that as part of this video here. So then also some smaller improvements like fuzzy key mixing has been brought into Virtual DJ with a few settings for it. And then also some things that are not on this list, like uh, they have a, a, a way to uh, to keep uh, orders in folders, and it works a couple of different ways. It doesn't just work by keeping it, because that wouldn't really be usable for all purposes. Then there's also uh, a new way to see which, uh, which tracks are actually part of these lists, so we'll go into that also. And then there's also a fix for uh, auto queue when you use that in combination with the keep playing status feature. And uh, I'll also get into that one. Uh, so a lot of ground to cover. And if you look into the uh, into the, the video description, there's some links so you can jump, jump to whatever part of this video that you would like to see something about. But we'll start out with this library organization thing because that's the thing you'll notice when you open Virtual DJ 2024. Uh, the browser section has changed, especially the left side of the, of the browser section, because of these conversions and this new uh, shortcuts toolbar. It may be a little confusing when you first uh, open it up, so uh, to avoid this confusion, let's do that first. And then the other parts are mostly new features, which you can just really leave be until you want to start try playing with them or using them. So. Uh, I would say that this library organization thing is the thing that everybody should know. So let's start there. So yes, it's true. The browser section looks rather different when you open it up, right? Because it looks like this now. So what happens to some of your stuff, you might say? Well, um, first thing you might notice is that there are no buttons over here. There might even not be buttons down here either, but you can always get those back by going in here and selecting some show only, and they'll, they'll show back up these three show only buttons. But what about the stuff up here? That used to be like uh, like some new virtual folders, and it used to be new filter folders, and used to be new favorite folders. Well, with all those buttons gone. Well, they actually become mostly right-click functions over here, except for uh, favorite folders, which are actually the bar now. It's called the shortcut bar. We'll get back to that later. The next thing you'll notice is probably that this stuff has arrived. The green one, ideas. So what's that? Well, that's most of uh, all the stuff that was previously in the lists and advices folder. So you have your charts, you have the genius DJ, you have your cloud lists, you have your ask the DJ, and you have your history. And then before you may not have had your filters in here, but they're there now by default, all your old filter folders. 
And another thing that's missing is all your old playlists. They're not there anymore because all the old playlists has been converted into the new playlists that are all just called lists. And they're all the old virtual folders and they're all the uh, old playlists. So the playlist specifically has been, uh, that was in here before in the old folder, has been converted and are now lists down here. So they're still here and you can still click them and you uh, still have all, uh, all your tracks in them. Uh, they're just called lists now. It's not all your playlists that's been converted. It's only the ones that Virtual DJ considered parts of its own world, the ones that are in here. If you just happen to have some other ones on your hard drive, it gets really M3U files behind the scenes, a very old standard for playlists, they're still there. So I, for instance, have some in here, so on, on my hard drive. So these are the old playlists that you can see, and uh, and they still work, and, still, and they haven't been touched. So that still works fine. Well, what about creating new ones where you don't have the three uh, buttons up here? Well, let's go through that. So virtual folders are now lists. So they're in my lists by default, but you can just grab them and put them everywhere like you could before. So, but that's where they start out uh, after the conversion, right? And uh, if you then click the, just my list folder, the mother folder, if you will, then you have this, then you can click here to create new lists. And it opens a little pop-up and that basically creates a new list. So that's just how you would expect it. Okay, and you can start putting tracks into it, right? Um, another way to do it is to right click this and say at list does exactly the same thing, no problem. You could also say at list down here, but then it's called create list subfolder because it's really a, a, a folder that's gonna be, just call it list two, it's gonna be below this folder that you right click, right? So that's subfolders. Um, so here for mother folders or here, uh, just to throw stuff in here, uh, or right click and get a subfolder. After you created a subfolder, again, you can just drag it wherever you want. So it's not really a problem where you create it. Then what about adding a new filter folder? Well, like I said, these are called filters now and all the old ones have been converted, if you will, and then put into this uh, filters under ideas so you can find them in here but that's not really a big problem because you can also just drag those and put them wherever you want uh, in your structure so like that but what if you want to create new ones well then you can actually just go someplace where you want to create it and then right click and then add a uh, a new filter because they're called filters now right so i'll go down here to my new list has some tracks in it and i right clicked it and I have an option to create a filter subfolder. And why is that a subfolder? Well, it's of course because it's subfolder to this list, but it's also because of the scope feature here, because it now sets the scope to be the parent folder. So that means if I put in something in the title, like it has to contain the letter A, it'll list the tracks within this list that has the letter A. A. So uh, that works nicely, but what about if I change this then? Well, I could change it to database, then I get all the tracks with A in, in the entire database. Of course, there are gonna be lots of those. And then there's a third setting, the parent recursive, this one. So that looks uh, like just like before in this new list, but it also looks, looks down here in my new sublist. So I knew there's, no, there's a track down there with, a, with the name work in it. So I'll put in work. And that's not in my list. It's only down here. I'll just close this one. So we use because it's it down here and because uh, that's, it's not in here, that'll only appear in my filter. We can just edit it. When this is set to parent recursive because it also looks in the subfolders, right? That's how you create new filters, like they're called now. Then there's old favorite folders. They have still survived. You can see that the yellow ones here are still there, but you can't really create new ones over here like you could before. So these still work. They basically just point us to some place on the hard drive, right? But now the idea is that you create shortcuts over here in the shortcut bar. So I go to some place on, on my hard drive, 
and just go through this. So I'm going here, pick that one, and then I can click the plus. And then I get this pop up to choose a uh, an icon for this shortcut. And I can also pick a color. So I'll pick the color red first. And I'll pick a little heart. So now I have a direct access to that. Show a shortcut, if you will. So not a favorite folder, but a shortcut. I can do the same for another one. So we can just see the difference. That one. And click the plus again. Pick an icon. Maybe get a color first. This kind of blue. Yes, that's nice. And a coffee cup. And look at that one. You can also add your own custom icons, if you will. But that's a way to do that fast. Of course, what it does, it jumps to that place, right? Just like a favorite folder did. So that's the idea of, of how to do that now. And then maybe an important thing, the favorite folders are not totally gone. Uh, you can still get them by right-clicking. So if I go to some place on the hard drive, like maybe this, this fun folder here, and I right-click it, I get an option to set as favorite. And then I then go back out here, I get my old school favorite folder. So you both have the shortcuts and the old school favorite folders. You can still create those. And like I said, the old ones still survives. And then there's maybe one more thing missing over here because there used to be like a back button, like a previous folder button, if you will. And that's not there anymore, but you can get that back in settings. Let's just do that. So I go into settings. And I search for previous folder, which is previous. And then I get that browser previous folder button. I set that to yes. And then at the top here, I get that back. back. So I can click that and go back and forth between places, just like previously, like that. And then these new lists have some additional settings, actually features, if you will, on them. So if you right click one of them, like this one, you can see I have no duplicates that I can enable, keep order and disable hot block. So what, what does those do? So let's try going through them. First of all, they're based on the folder. So if I enable no, no duplicates on this one and I right click the next one, it hasn't got it enabled. I can enable it and I can disable it, but it's going to be independent because it's still going to be on the first one, right? So it's based on each of them. So if we do no duplicates first here, that's pretty obvious what that does. It removes the duplicates. Uh, it doesn't do it instantly. So for instance, if I deselect that and I go up and put in up by Kali B one more time. And now, so you can see it's here twice and I do no duplicates, then you can still see it. But if I click something else and I go back, then you can see it has removed the second one of those, right? So the duplicate really. And um, if, that also means that if I go back into here and I grab it again and try to put it into my list, it won't work. It's still only there one time. Then there are the next setting or feature, if you will, on this on the list, and that is keep order. If I enable that, you can see the columns actually changes here in the in the in this browser setting, right? Because it now has it its own. So that means that not only can I tell this to be ordered by artist instead, and I can tell it that I don't want a remix to be shown. So move that up, up here, so I don't have remix anymore. So ordered by artist, artist and no remix. And then I, when I go to the, another one, then it goes back. It's ordered by the BPM like before. And uh, if it goes to a, th a third one, uh, this one, test, it's also ordered by uh, BPM and has the remix. Um, but when I go back to this one, it remembers that which columns I want and what uh, ordering or sorting I want. So that's that little bit. That's pretty cool. That means that each list can has its own uh, columns and it can have its own sorting that it goes back to when you go back to the, uh, the list, no matter what you have done to lists in the meantime. And then, of course, if I disable it again, 
it'll jump right back to sharing these things with all the other for uh, all the other lists, right? So the last thing here is actually the opposite. You have to actually disable hot block. What is hot block? Well, that means that when you move your, your files around, the track files around that are in this list, maybe uh, around to a different drive and stuff, uh, the, the list goes with it. And you might not want that. You might not want to put that everywhere, split it uh, all across, um, uh, for instance, uh, removable drive and stuff like that. So you can disable that on a, a, on, a uh, on a list. You can also do it in the settings. So you do it for all new lists, meaning that if I go into settings, so it's hot plug. I can say disable hot plug for new lists. And we can read at the bottom. It says, Set all new lists to disabled hot block, which will keep the list on the main drive instead of splitting it across the various drives where the content is. So if I set that to yes, and I go back and I create yet another list, for instance, create list subfolder here, and call it test. You see, now it's disabled by default if you don't want this stuff. Then there's a couple of other uh, little settings worth mentioning regarding this. And the first one is called Browser Auto Export in Treu. So let's just search for Auto Export. And uh, this one. And like you can see in the in the in the description, is automatically save the M3U copy in this folder uh, for each list in my lists, and that's really for sort of a backward compatibility for other software. I believe this was made so like like great hackers will still work, so other software is able to to le to read uh, virtual DDoS uh, data the way that it's usually. Uh, read them. So if you're, for instance, playing with great hackers, you should probably enable that one. The other one that I want to mention is called browser show side view in lists. If I enable that one, and I go into my lists over here, you can see the side view side list, side view automix, and side view karaoke is now also here. And if I close this one, you can see they have content, which is the same as it is in my uh, list uh, in the bottom right of the screen. Then there's a link track view, and that's really all about linking tracks together manually. So you can manually mark which tracks go well together. Uh, and you get to them by going to the remixes pane and clicking the little menu and selecting show tracks linked to the playing song instead here. So you have this, and then uh, when I load and play a track over here, uh, that's not linked to anything, but I can then grab another track and say, I want it to be linked to this one. And then um, every time I load th this track up here, I'll get this link. And every time I load the track I link to, I get a backward link. So it go also goes the other way. Uh, and of course, you can put in more than one track here. So that works nicely. And now we have a direct link and we have the backwards link. Uh, so uh, that's pretty nice. And then uh, that also has a history setting. So you can actually also see what it may go well together based on what uh, you usually pay played with. Another way of, uh, instead of grabbing and putting it in there, and another way of marking it is by right clicking the, uh, the artwork and then mark track link to let go. That's what is on the opposite deck. So I can do that. And then that also goes down there. So you can link it to multiple tracks at the same time and so on and so forth. So that's a really cool feature to like make little mini sets, but I've done, uh, done a separate little video on that. And I'll link that video in the video description. And like I said, it's not really part of Virtual TD 2024. It was released about a month before. So people have already started using it and probably seen it before this version. And you can actually also see them in the info pane if you want. You just have to enable them first. So it's that menu and fields and has links. And that'll be this one. Uh, and this, if there are more than one, there'll be a little 
that down. So let's load the other track here. You can see if I click it, you can see both of them. And if you click more, then this will switch. So you can see it, the same view as before. So one final thing about linked tracks, at least in this video, is that you can actually query it, meaning that you can, for instance, add a color rule based on linked tracks. So I'm going to here add a color rule, say, well, this used to be based on has links. So if that is one, um, then you should turn this track green, so like that. So that now means that these two turn green because they have direct links here. Uh, if I load this one, you can see that also turns green because it has direct links, but it also gives you the information over here that the backward one that it points against, that's the one we just loaded, that actually also has link tracks, but these two up here that it links to, uh, that this one links to does not have link tracks themselves. That also means that if I look at the let go one down here, that does not have uh, direct links, it's only linked backwards. Like that, you can see here. So that's not going to be colored green. So that's just a, a nifty little extra thing that you can do. So the main new feature in Visual DJ 2024 is Cloud Drive. And what's Cloud Drive? Well, that's really all about syncing your tracks and related info between laptops using a Cloud Drive or a cloud based storage, if you will. So uh, it's really so that your, all your laptops always have the same information and are ready to go if you just do your preparation and downloading and adding and all this sort of stuff on one of them and have this set up correctly. Like, so a lot of people have actually done this manually by adding their tracks to a cloud drive or cloud storage and then moving the database around or maybe having it be on a cloud uh, drive and then automatically syncing and all this kind of stuff. It's a little risky. There's like a, a long list of what you should do and what you should not do and all this kind of stuff if you wanted to do this uh, before. But now it's all automatic because it's part of Virtual DJ. So because it's based on your already existing uh, cloud drive or cloud storage, if you have one, uh, it's, it's not going to cost you anything in Virtual DJ, uh, which is not the same as how it is in other uh, DJ softwares. So it'll just basically be free, or it'll, at least it'll be part of the, this package, so they don't have to uh, to give Virtual DJ or Atomics any more money just because you want to use this. So you get to it by going into Online Music and into Cloud Drive, and the first time you click this, uh, it'll ask you to log in to whatever Cloud Drive you like. But I, as you can see right here, um, in Storage Engine, you can see the ones that you can use, and you can see I've currently using Dropbox. So I signed into that one. Now, the first time you sign in, it may be a little bit uh, harder because you need to do some multi-factor authentication and stuff. That's all depending on your cloud drive. So that would be like that if you had a new laptop anyway. But just uh, uh, notice that maybe the first time you sign in, it'll take like a few minutes and maybe an email or maybe an, maybe an SMS or something like that, depending on your cloud drive. So you can actually just click in here to start adding to your cloud drive once you've signed in. So you click there and you create a folder and you can start adding track to it. And that's nice. Let's just call that test one. So now we have a, a, a list, one of the new lists here uh, on our cloud drive. And we can, of course, put tracks into it and that'll all get synced. But maybe a, a more realistic option is to use some of the stuff you already have. So for instance, down here, I have uh, my new list. So I can right click that one and I can tell it to sync to Cloud Drive, like that. I can also do it to this old filter folder here, so I can tell it to sync to Cloud Drive, and then they'll also be synced to the Cloud Drive. So what actually happens then? Well, what happens is that a new virtual DJ folder is being created in the root of your of your Cloud Drive, Cloud Storage, so in this case Dropbox, and all the tracks are getting put into here. And also some other information, we'll get back to some of that later, but for now you can see we have this VDJ folders.json, so that's the file that's actually keeping track of all the folders that's over here. So that's where it goes, and of course, all the other laptops that you set up 
can actually read from this place. So now it's all about keeping the syncing in line, really, for all the other features, because it simply goes here. And in Dropbox, you can actually see the virtual DJ folder and some of the other st uh, storage options, it'll be hidden. But for us, we can see what's happening, and uh, I think that's nice, but it, of course, uh, shows some of the internals of Virtual DJ Cloud Drive, if you will. And now that like you can see all the in animations across the screen have ended, so now they have all been synced, they've all been uploaded to the, the little cloud drive, basically. So you get this little cloud icon instead, so you can see that they're in the cloud and ready to go. So what can actually be synced? Well, we just saw me syncing a, a new uh, list that I made. I also synced a, uh, a, a, an existing list, and that has a slightly different icon, but that's because it has some sublists which are also synced. So this one was empty, but this one was not. So that's also synced. So that's nice. And then you saw me do a, uh, a favorite folder that actually also gets turned into a list here. So that has now also been synced as a list. And it also has this different icon because it has a subfolder here and a sub subfolder. But really, it's all about tracks and lists and a few additional things. But that's probably mainly what you want to work with, unless you want to add your entire collection and then just have this cloud drive handle everything. That's also a fair a valid option because that's, of course, maybe what you want to do if you want to, for instance, synchronize your primary DJ laptop and your secondary or pack up DJ laptop. But what is actually being synced then? Well, of course, the tracks, but it actually also syncs some more stuff. Um, because that's also all the, all the database stuff, right? So uh, it is, adds the database information over there, so that gets synced to. So the BPM and your and your keys uh, detections and your hot cues and all this kind of stuff. And it actually continues to synchronize that. So if you just do a change to a hot cue on a track that's part of the synchronization, it'll change the hot cue on all laptops. So that's pretty cool. That means you can prepare or change uh, already prepared tracks on whatever laptop and it gets synchronized. This information gets synchronized to the other laptops. It's so very cool. Uh, it all also automatically uh, does the changes to a list. So if you add more tracks to a list that's already on the cloud drive, it'll also sync that information. And uh, maybe even more important, if you prepare stems, like prepare stems on your fastest laptop, those prepared stems will also get synchronized to the other laptop. So when you go to a new laptop and you load a track that has prepared stems, the stems are gonna be ready for use, even though you haven't prepared them on this laptop. So of course, now we need to see some examples of this actually working, right? But to do that, we actually need two laptops for it to make sense. So what I've done right now is that, of course, I've signed up two laptops to the same cloud drive, signed in and stuff. Uh, but then I've also created these three dummy shortcuts. So they don't do anything, but on this laptop, they're red. And on this second laptop, they're gonna be green, like you can see here. So now you can definitely tell the laptops apart. You can probably also tell it by the audio because it's two different mics that I'm using to record this one. So what's inside my cloud drive on this laptop? Well, let's go in and check. That's actually the three lists that I wanted to sync. And the test was empty, right? This was full of tracks with some subfolders, and this had even more tracks in it. So they've all been synced. So that's nice. Of course, I just started this one. So the syncing is actually done best at startup, I would say, because that's when it checks everything. But you could also force a synchronization if something is missing. So what if I change something? So what happens when I add a track to one of the lists that are already there? So let me try grabbing this one that also has prepared stems. And I'm going into the test one, which is a Cloud Drive uh, list and which is currently empty. So you can see it starts uploading it, and it's done. And it gets the icon. And over here on the other laptop, you can see it will have been synchronized into this list. So when we load it now, the stems are being brought down from the cloud drive. So like that. So what happens then if we make a change to this track, like maybe add another hot queue? Well, let's find out. And please notice that we're now on this secondary laptop or the second laptop. You can see the 
green icons over there. So not on the one that we did all the first stuff with. This is the other latch up that we're now using to make changes. So let's jump, just jump all the way over here maybe, back here, and say I want my third cue point on this track to be added here. So that'll of course just work. So what happens then when I open Virtual DJ on my first laptop? Uh, you can see that illustrated by the red icons. And I go into the cloud drive here and into this playlist. Well, of course, it's still going to be there. But if I load it now, you can see that it has the third uh, cue point here. So that has been synchronized automatically. So to sum it all up, what did we see? Well, we saw that we could add lists and tracks on one laptop and it got synchronized to the other laptops. And we can add tracks to already existing links and it got synchronized to the other laptops. And we could make changes to the tracks and that also got synced to the other laptops. And furthermore, if you had prepared stems that also got synchronized to the other laptops. So that's really what this thing does. It doesn't sound like a lot maybe, but it can really be used for a lot of things. So what do I think this will be used for? Well, one of the scenarios that uh, Atomics have talked about is that if you can have like a, a emergency playlist here and then when you go to someone else's party and they have virtual DJ installed, you can just sign in and you can work with your own tracks that are already prepared, including maybe their stems. Well, I don't think that's like the main use case. I think this will mainly be used to uh, synchronize your, your laptops, uh, so your primary and your backup laptop. That's also a reason why it's not so important that if, you, it, if it does all the, uh, the synchronization live or if you have to restart because it's really for the next time you open Virtual DJ on your other laptop, right? That's the main use case in my, in my opinion. And actually I have a, a secondary use case that I think I'm going to use it with because I usually use three laptops a lot because I have some breaks at work. So I, why not use that for to buy new tracks and and to uh, to prepare the tracks, so like setting uh, some some cue points uh, mainly, right? So I do, I do that quite a lot on my work laptop, but of course that's not the one that I'm DJing with. So uh, uh, it'll be nice that I can do that on my work laptop when I have a break at work, and then I uh, I when I get home and open my DJ laptop, that'll then been synchronized, and then when I open my backup laptop, that will have been synchronized there too. So I synchronize and I prepare on my uh, primary laptop. Then I come home to my DJ laptop. I might prepare stems on that one because it's much faster. And then uh, on my third laptop, the backup DJ laptop, that'll also be ready for use. I just have to make sure it, there's an internet connection or that I have had it opened with an internet connection for a few minutes before I leave the gig. And everything will be ready when I get there. So there are a few more things to talk about uh, when it comes to Cloud Drive, uh, there are some settings, there are some options to force download, there are some ways you can um, remove it again, there are ways to see if you want it to be actually a folder uh, on the laptop when you download it, uh, synchronize it to download, and all these kind of things. But those are like little details, and I think I will leave that for another video. Also, this is continuously being worked on, so new features will come and new use cases will come. But again, I think that's going to be for another video. So the second major new feature is fuzzy key mixing. And what's that all about? Well, before we look into that, we should probably agree upon what regular key mixing is all about. Because that's a bit simpler, and then we'll move on. So key mixing is basically about mixing a track into another track that's in the same key. So this track is in B minor, so you should really mix it into another track that's in B minor. That would be key mixing, right? But luckily, according to uh, musical theory, you, can, you have a few more options because if we move it up a step and look into harmonic mixing instead, or harmonic key mixing, if you will, then you don't really need to go into only B minor. You can also go into a few other uh, notes or chords, if you will. Uh, and that's where the Camelot wheel come in. So this is a Camelot wheel and it's from mixingkey.com, but there's a million of them and they're all the same. So this is just a little helper thingy to help you figure out what goes well to get together. So if you, for instance, have a track that's in G major, then the rule of the Camelot wheel is you can only go, 
go one step and it'll still be in uh, you can still do harmonic mixing if you just move one step so of course it'll go well with another track that's in G major that's kind of self-explanatory but it'll also go well with a track that's in E minor because that's the uh, that, that's the parallel tonality to G major it'll also go well with D major and it'll also go well with C major so we have itself G major, we have uh, one step this way, we have one step this way, and we have going into the other circle here, to the minor. And those are the ones that will work great for harmonic mixing. So um, that's a little bit hard to remember. So of course this one was made and people kind of learned that by heart. Uh, but it was also a little bit easier to look at the numbers that has been assigned to these. So if you have a track that's in 9B, which is D major, then you can only move to 10B or 8B or 9A. So the same number, but the different letter. Those will be harmonic mixing. So these three options plus, of course, itself. But then, of course, we got the ability to change the key of a track. So if I play this track, I can change its key. So that's nice, but it goes a little crazy, like you could hear. So there's kind of a, like a rule of thumb saying you should never move it more than one semitone, meaning one step. So either uh, stay in key or go one key up or go one key uh, down with either one step, which is one semitone in, each, in either direction. Then it'll sound pretty good because it's not too bad. So this is the real key. Yeah. One up, one down. It's not too bad. So that's nice. But that, of course, opens a whole lot of options when you look over here. Because now if you have G major again, and you couldn't really find a track you wanted to play in either of, of these four, so itself and of these three, then you could try changing G major one semitone or change the new track one semitone. Uh, depending on what you do so so one semitone up from G major that will be G sharp major that's not here because that's the same as a flat major so that would be this one over here and that would give us three new ones to uh, harmonic will mix into if we accept that we change it one semitone by changing the key of the track the same the other way around if you go the other way around then G major will be uh, F sharp major, so this one, and then we get other ones to mix into, right? So that gives us a lot of extra options uh, for harmonic mixing if we just accept that we can move it one semitone. And that's actually what Virtual DD has been able to do for us for a long, long time. So uh, if I have a track loaded here that's in G major, uh, and I load another track that's in G sharp major here. Of course, those won't harmonically mix. It's actually a pretty horrible step between those two uh, if you just start them. But it's only one semitone apart, which means that if I click the key button over here, it'll tell me your track has automatically shifted by one semitone in order to make it harmonical, harmonically compatible with the other deck. So now they're both G, but just shifting it one semitone. And I can actually uh, do that automatically if I want to by going into the settings here and telling it to auto match key. Now if I unload this track again and load it again, it'll, because I haven't removed this by sending the cross, it'll get us, give us the pop-up. Of course, you don't want to see that forever, but it will automatically have shifted this to G and you can say it says minus one. So that was the old school harmonic mixing, but it's still a little bit hard to figure out what's happening, right? So for to help us with that, uh, Virtual D Day also have an extra column called key difference, and you could also see these markers. These markers was also there before, but now they've moved onto this key difference uh, column here. So basically, Virtual DJ is telling us how many steps there needs to be before before a uh, 
something matches. So of course, this is the loaded track uh, on this deck. So this will match fine with itself. It'll match fine with anything that's in G major. Uh, and you can also say it's a zero steps. But you can also see that uh, it has this uh, full gray uh, little tick, meaning these goes well together. But this one is one semitone, so that's a light gray, because in order for that one to go well together, you'll have to let it do a, a key shift to minus one, right? Like it just did before. So, uh, so that's little an indicator saying, well, this is one semitone uh, away from doing a good harmonic making. It didn't have to be G sharp. It could be any one of the of the of the okay ones on the Camelot wheel. Uh, so it didn't have to be be close to G. It couldn't be close to one of the others as well. But this one, that's two semitones. So that won't work. So I'm gonna just disable this thing again and say, well, don't auto match key, but uh, let me just load list this one instead. And of course, there's no auto match, but if I click the key to make it do harmonic mixing, it'll tell me smart key match only applies if the key changes within plus one, one, one minus one semitone. So it simply won't help us do this. Of course, like I said previously, we can do it by hand. So we can change this to be uh, something that it fits well with, for instance, itself. Um, so that'll be an option, uh, but uh, then we have to uh, to move several keys to make it work, right? So again, this is the old school one, the regular harmonic mixing based on the Camelot wheel. And if you really like the Camelot wheel and like the colors of it, and that helps you uh, remember it instead of these steps and instead of these musical keys, you can click the key and it'll change to the same colors as we have over here, so these this color scheme. So that'll now be the same as these colors here. But this was the old school harmonic mixing. Now let's move on to the fuzzy key mixing. So fuzzy key mixing is really all about breaking the rule of one step here. So before, if we had a G major track, we could either go to one up from 9B to 10B to D major, or we can go one down here to C major, 8B, or we could move into 9A. Those were the only legal steps for harmonic mixing, right? Stay 9B, of course. Now with fuzzy key mixing, some people have found out it's almost as good, or it's usually as good if you do it diagonally. So that means that 9B also goes pretty well together with 10A. And with AA, 8A, and the same for 9A, that goes pretty well with 10B, and pretty well with 8B. And that, of course, means that there's a whole lot more that works well together. So that's basically the rule of fuzzy key matching. But it's not as good at rule and the, as the old rule, meaning that if you choose to pick the other ones here, you probably wanna, uh, you probably wanna test it by ear before you call it harmonic mixing, because it's not always as great uh, as the old school way of doing it. Now, of course, if you combine this with allowing uh, the track to be moved to one semitone, like we discussed before, uh, and combining that with the new rules of fuzzy key mixing, it'll open up a whole lot of more keys, right? So, for instance, if we go back to G major, uh, and uh, it now has this entire batch, of uh, legal uh, uh, keys for harmonic mixing. Then if we allow it to go up to G sharp major, which again was the same as A flat major, then all of these will work, right? If you uh, allow for it to be moved one semitone together with the fuzzy key mixing. And the same in the other direction, that'll then be F sharp major, which is this one. So there'll be all these ones that'll also work, right? If you allow for this. And that's actually what Virtual DJ can now do. So you can combine the fuzzy key mixing with the one semitone uh, change uh, for harmonic mixing. So if we go into the settings and we go into options and we put in fuzzy, and we do this fuzzy stuff, then it'll also indicate uh, that this works uh, with these other keys and It'll also do the automatic um, key match if you set that up. So let's try enabling fuzzy. 
and now you can see now they're all one two or zero so only the twos won't work because I will only do one semitone step right so I won't change two uh, semitone step but all the other ones work now because we are allowing this fussy key matching so that's pretty cool so it lets you do a whole lot more now fussy key matching which is almost as good right so what's then the final step well the final step is like you saw before, there's actually yet another setting. Forty full. And like you can see at button, this now allows for two semitones when you match. So that means that if you allow for that, like this, then they'll basically all match. Meaning that if I load a track and I load another track, and I press key, then it'll be shifted by two semitones here because it was labeled two. That wasn't allowed before, but because I did the fuzzy full, that's now allowed. So it's moved this two. So now it's B minor to E minor, and that's allowed according to the fuzzy rules and the two steps. So no problem. So that's what, what they all do. They'll all work basically when you allow for both of these things so it's crazy and you should definitely use your ears when you do this stuff so that's fussy key mixing and fussy key mixing plus of fussy full if you will everything can go with basically everything now but again trust your ears So if you don't know, keep play status on load song. That's actually a feature where you can have the deck continue to play when you throw a song on top of it instead of pausing and waiting for you to do something with the track. So basically, if I enable that and I start playing a track over here, and I start playing another track over here, and I mix into that track, and I pick a third track and throw it over here, That'll start playing instantly so I can mix into it. And of course, the same goes if I put it over here. It'll start playing instantly and I can mix into it right away. So that's the feature and that's been that like that for a long time. But that's actually a little bit of a bug because what you saw was that it actually started from the beginning of the track, right? And that's okay. Or oh, maybe skip silence. So that is the default. So that's okay. But you could also have another setting for starting the track because you could have auto cue set to something. Now it's set to skip silence, that's a default, but a very popular one is Q or Q skip silence. So Q uh, meaning Q and Q uh, or skip silence if it doesn't have any Q points. So let's just pick Q for the simplicity here. So the idea is now that a track should always load at the first Q point, right? And uh, that actually didn't work before, it did work, but it didn't work if you use it in combination with auto play and load, like we saw the, the, the key play and load. So uh, it didn't work if you enabled that. Probably because the key play status and load actually triggered before this was checked. So it just started from the beginning of the track, but that has now been fixed. So that means if I go back now, so I have this set to Q and I have the uh, key uh, playing status. Then if I go back now and I start playing a track, mix into it. With the other track, mix into it, and throw a track on top of this one. Then it starts playing from the Q point, right? And the same thing on the other deck. Started from the first Q point. So that's basically the fix. And I can of course continue here. So that's a little uh, trick here. Because I haven't mixed out of this song, it likes to tell me, are you sure you want to do this? And I click OK, and it'll do it and start from the first cue point. Now, if you want it to start, uh, load the track and start, uh, even though it's audible because you haven't mixed out of it, you need to, uh, to do a little extra thing, which is basically the load security that you need to disable. So if I disable that one and I do the same thing, 
basically just setting this in the middle, playing tracks and throwing tracks on top of the uh, of the decks. Uh, it'll just continue playing these uh, new tracks regardless if they're if the currently playing tracks are rec uh, audible at that time. So like this. So just load some, even though the old one are already audible. And it plays them. Like that. So that has always been there. But the new feature, of course, or the new fix, is that this now works with auto, the auto queue setting. So it'll start from the first queue point if you want it to. So one final thing I want to mention before I end this video, which is probably rather long by now, is how you can go back to Virtual D-Day 2023 if you really need to. And that's just a matter of going into virtualdday.com slash download slash build. I have all the, put this in the video description and then go grab an older build down here. Uh, there are of course lots of them, but the 7921, this one is the final Virtual D-Day 2023. So that's probably what you want. And then you simply download it, and after you download it, you install it on top of the other one, and then you will have uh, the the uh, the executables or the binaries for Virtual Day 2023 back. I'll get back to that in a second. Another option, uh, if you will, is to uh, go into this folder, the program files files less Virtual DJ, and locate the Virtual DJ.exe file and rename that to something like 2024 in the end, so you keep it. And then install uh, on top, and then we'll get a new executable just called Virtual DJ Exe, and that'll be 2023. That way you can keep multiple versions, like you can see I've done here with older versions. So right now I'm kind of opposite. So my this one is the 2024 one, and this is the final 2023 one. But that's just names. So that means I can actually just double click this one to open it and get 2023 back. Then there'll actually be a, a few more things to do because, like you can see, I do have get my list and advices back, but there's really nothing inside of it. So I'm missing some stuff, but you can get that back by clicking this little dot menu, going into root elements, and click reset root folders. Then I get all this stuff back in here. And my filters are down here in a separate folder. So that's a nice little way to go back to 2023 if you really need to.